Um, so I've really been an admirer of Kai's work for quite some time, and I think we're really lucky to have him here tonight to share some of this work with us. Uh, I think one of the reasons uh, in particular why we're lucky is because it took me something like five years to remember Kai's name. Um, and so the, the, what I mean by this is that I remember really specifically, like around five years ago, I, I was at someone's house and I saw uh, a particular painting uh, which was produced by Kai uh, and it belonged to this series which I think uh, is part of the History of One Organism uh, series uh, which Kai has been working on. I remember commenting on this painting and the owner told me this was made by a guy named Kai Franz and I, I thought that's great and then I forgot this uh, pretty much as soon as possible. And then uh, some years later I was uh, surfing the internet and I saw these incredibly odd objects, uh, which were something like uh, kind of fossils, uh, which were made uh, out of uh, sand and glue and some kind of arcane uh, technical process. Uh, and I remember thinking that these things, uh, here's the guy's house who I was at, uh, I remember thinking that, that, that these things were also really incredible. Uh, and I looked at who made them, and it was this guy named Kai Franz, and I thought that's great. And then I, again, I forgot this uh, then for a second time. And then through some kind of really unlikely coincidence, uh, I came across an, a number of prints of these uh, also quite unusual AutoCAD-like drawings in Germany. Uh, and I remember thinking that they were really uncanny because they reminded me of these peculiar sand-like fossils that I'd seen some years uh, previously. Uh, and so I asked who made these. Uh, and it turns out that, of course, the drawings, the painting, uh, and the models were all produced uh, by Kai. Uh, and so I was kind of thinking about uh, encountering Kai's work uh, in this way as a series of episodes loosely hanging together in my own memory by a combination of certain recurring aesthetic coincidences uh, in the work uh, and a certain amount of uh, sort of pure coincidence in the process through which they're made. Uh, and it seemed to me that this is a, a pretty good way to introduce uh, Kai's work. Kai, I think, is really an expert in making things that uh, kind of hang together loosely. Uh, and uh, I think now maybe tonight you'll see that, that one way to, to sort of read this is maybe in the most literal sense of that phrase. Uh, but the work, is, the work is quite captivating in part because it looks like it's always sort of moments away from falling apart. Uh, but perhaps more importantly, Kai's work is also invested in exploring the ways in which artifacts like digital drawings on a computer, a sandy fossil, a machine, and their creators all hang together uh, loosely. So by hanging together loosely, I mean here that the CAD drawing that I'd found in Germany and the sandy objects I'd seen online some years previously were part of the same project. Uh, and in fact, the drawings preceded the object. And in some sense, they allowed the object to exist, uh, but in a very strange way. While the, object, while the drawing was necessary for the object, the drawing was neither a drawing of the object, nor was the object a construction of the drawing. In other words, the two artifacts hung together loosely. Now, Kai's expertise is important for architecture to consider, particularly now, because many of our most enduring disciplinary conventions, uh, technological instruments, and even the legal structures and protocols of professional practice have been designed to better manage the looseness with which drawings, objects, and thoughts hang together. Uh, now, you certainly encounter this uh, sort of ethos in studio nearly every day. Uh, in fact, it's probably one of your greatest sources of frustration. Uh, other than your professors. Uh, for example, your, your 3D print uh, doesn't resemble the Rhino model, uh, or the, the colors in your plot don't look like the colors uh, on your screen. Uh, in other words, these are sort of moments in which the kind of technologies we, we employ, uh, or the kind of disciplinary protocols we use, uh, and their sort of ethos of mim mimesis have broken down. Uh, so, uh, I have to find where I am. The more we can imagine these things uh, sort of resembling each other, uh, the happier we tend to be, uh, the more professional we all appear to be, and the, and the more the whole proposition of architecture seems to hang together. So this is one of the reasons why I'm really happy to have Kai here tonight, because his ideas, uh, the machines and processes he designs, and the artifacts that emerge as a result uh, all make more difficult the ethos of mimesis that makes uh, what architects do seem to make sense. So much so uh, that I don't really have the vocabulary to describe the relationship between these elements as they play themselves out in his work, only to say that they hang together loosely. Uh, and in hanging together loosely, they not only suggest ways of making things, but ultimately uh, other models of the imagination. Uh, so Kai is coming to us tonight from the Rhode Island School of Design in Providence, uh, where he's an assistant professor uh, in the Experimental and Foundation Studies program. Kai studied uh, architecture in Aachen, Germany, and the ETH in Zurich, uh, and at Princeton University. Uh, between Zurich and New Jersey, Kai was awarded a Fulbright Fellowship, uh, where he earned, earned an MFA degree uh, in digital media from RISD. 
Uh, and in addition to his teaching at Rhode Island, he's taught uh, at the ETH, Princeton, and McGill. And in 2013, uh, he was uh, a fellow at the Academy Schloss Solitude, where uh, he left some peculiar AutoCAD drawings lying around. So uh, please join me in welcoming Kai. Um, what a beautiful introduction. I, um, I really like this, uh, I guess, idea of like present and absence and encountering the works in these different ways. Um, really interesting. Um, so I'll have to think about that a little more. But mm. thank you very much, Curtis, for the invitation. I'm incredibly excited and honored to be here tonight. I know that Jeff is also in the audience here um, this evening. And I um, want to thank him for his support and guidance over the years. So it's, uh, it's a real treat for me to be here tonight. Um, I'm showing this opening image as an introduction to my early interests. Um, as we just heard from Curtis, I studied architecture at RWTH Aachen and ETH Zurich in my undergraduate degrees. I also had some expertise in computer science. Early on during my studies, I tried to integrate computation into the architectural design process. This project was an example of a self-organized um, of a self-organized building that was designed entirely algorithmically. The consequence for the architectural design methodologies seemed to suggest a paradigm shift, I thought. <coughs> the shift to design Generative systems, which make relative decisions rather than absolute ones, still resonate with me today. One of the critics, an architect from Madrid, questions back then if I had really considered the building from all of its angles in the urban context. Indeed, I had not. For, the, for me, the conceptual framework had more virtue. The 3D, print, the 3D printed model is still around, like a little sculpture. It hovers over my toilet today. Here's an early project of mine that I did in 2012. The Guggenheim New York is a series of mechanically produced sculptures that take, sorry, a machine that takes models of canonical buildings and dips them into paint over and over again. On the one hand, I am interested in how the process of additive subtraction, the layering of paint over a highly prescribed, described form, achieves a decay of form while also leading to a new formal language. On the other hand, I'm searching for the moment when an object changes its medium condition, the point where architecture becomes art. At the same time, all of these works problematize issues of scale. As models, these pieces exist on a 1 to 200 scale, yes, as, yet as objects, they also exist on a 1 to 1 scale. The material properties of paint, together with the physical resistance of gravity, room temperature, humidity, etc., make the process unscalable bound to the 1 to 1. These pieces thus collapse from being distinctly in the realm of architecture and art into mutual medium condition, a 1 to 200 to 1 to 1 scale that superimposes the representational with the, with the actual object nature within one thing. It is, of course, no coincidence that the object under attack here is the Guggenheim New York. No building has ever narrated the continuum, progress, and apotheosis of modernism as well as this one. My gesture, the drip, stays constant and insists, much like the continuous white wall of the actual museum, ascending and expanding in upward motion. However, the, the iterative nature of the process, the repetitive dipping into paint, ultimately captures an entirely different position. Machine as mode and medium. For tonight's lecture, I went back to my thesis statement, and I wanted to read some excerpts to contextualize the next project. Architecture has reached a, st a state of imminent high resolution. This project proposes an alternative methodology for a new resolution in architecture, away from overdetermined high res to a new low res architecture that operates within the grain of computation and that activates the will of matter. In our discipline, we establish formal regularity, redefinedness, precision, and perfection to be the norm. I want to make clear from the very beginning that resolution in architecture for me is not about formal definitions and geometric complexities, but rather rooted in, in issues of determination and around scale. In this sense, the Swiss box is as equally high res as all as the Gearian complexity and the smooth slickness that the recent decade has produced. With the fetishization of the crisp impeccable, architecture has reached, has grown to a state of totalizing control and perfection. BIM models, 2D slash 3D rendering, uh, software, contemporary com computer numeric controlling increasingly feed our desire to determine and describe everything. In the end, it seems to me we use all available technology towards one end. The seemingly high res 
forces the material manifestations to work against their nature. Building execution is reduced to a one-to-one -one magnetic relationship between the buildings and the tools that created them. Or, to put it differently, in our discipline, our discipline has produced a model in which planning and design are smart and agitated, and execution remains dumb and still. In this approach to low-res architecture, design determination is shifted into the realm of execution. Planning, design, and implementation become, become subject to material osmosis, a methodology that util utilizes the physical scale of materials, their behavior, will, and imperfection, control, and chance, all as means to design. In low-res architecture, the role of resolution and control become immediate and necessary collaborators. The rule set of the process, here almost entirely mechanized, at times, materi at times material, at other times immaterially rooted in the logic of computation, is inherently dependent upon increment, scale, and dimension. Low resolution has an arbitrariness that feels awkward, as it comes neither from the composed basis of architectural form, the legacy, in composition, the legacy of composition in painting, nor the simple haphazard randomness of an event, a table after a dinner party. Instead, it feels at moments awkwardly casual. In the following slides, I will juxtapose my artist statement with some, of, uh, with some images of recent works. So this is now a little bit of a jump. If the earlier works that I showed or images were from 2012, these are uh, rather recent. Plopper, dual axis position to position system, is a machine I constructed to make objects. I like to think that the plopper is something like the bad conscious of formal idealism, a kind of low res 3D printer that translates the smart, trim, and generally wonderful numbers, points, lines, and algorithms into thick, viscous, and cumbersome, and opaque realm in the nexus of matter and reality. For the last six years, I've been working on a body of work centered around the plopper. The machine primarily fabricates sculptures, but occasionally also produces prints, drawings, and films. The sculptures begin as digital drawings created with computer-aided design software that are then fabricated through custom um, CAMS process. The plopper, a hijacked architectural plotter, first deposits sand, then it rubs resin into, onto a landscape of sand, building the sculptures layer by layer. The machine and process are designed to critique contemporary fabrication technology for its premature relationship of the physical to the digital, of virtuality to, actu tech to actuality, and of matter to materiality. While the plopper's input, virtual 3D models and CAD drawings, are regulated by control, precision, perfection, the machine utilizes chance, imperfection, and the will of matter in an effort to overcome determination. Sometimes I think of the plops as alien spit, a reference to their serial nature, futuristic characteristic, and loose geometric qualities. Simultaneously, the works also read as remnants of some long diseased civilization, as archaeological relics or as artifacts retrieved from the bottom of the ocean. The title for my recent solo exhibition at the Bell Gallery at Brown University, while still before us after all, was an attempt to highlight and foreground this contradictory, contradictory temporal dimension of the work. It was also an effort to render the body of work visible as an, as an acceleration of today, as a dark residue of our current culture and technologically determined existence. Here is an image of the installation um, of the exhibition showing a video alongside two different plops. The exhibition took place at the List Art Center at Brown University. The building was designed by iconic American modernist architect Philip Johnson. I was very much interested in the conversation that would unfold between my own work and the brutalist architecture of the building, both materially in terms of the tectonics of the building um, and the relationship of the grids and the ordering structures of the building next to the seemingly expressive wobbly grids that are present in my own work. I'll now go back to the beginning of the project and cast some light on the process and explain some of the technicalities behind the work. The project with dual access position to position system, or plopper, began as part of my thesis in architecture in Princeton in 2012. I appropriated a large format printer or plotter from the school and physically hacked it. And so the plotter became a plopper. 
Here you see the machine in its first iteration back in 2012. I added these arms to the plotter and lifted the axis of the printhead so that it could freely maneuver over, a 2D, over every point on a 2D plane. What originally fed paper through the machine now moved a wooden bed. These are the deposition heads, a cup holder and a funnel. It was important to me to stay rather ad hoc in this design. And here you see some images of the actual uh, kind of plopping process. So the machine would deposit uh, various powder and liquid materials. I sta very much stayed with sand and uh, uh, resin, became kind of like the most materials I used. Um, and so it creates this, what I would call, serialized landscape in the first go. And then in the second run, uh, you know, dep deposits the resin, which, um, you know, so the, mas the machine deposits the resin onto the landscape of sand. The resin, where the resin hits the sand, it sinks into it and freezes the form. Materially, <coughs> I'm interested in a new hybrid condition, a strange composite, sand and resin, inorganic matter, an eroded landscape adhered by plastic. Here you can see how the plop is removed from the bat after the polyurethane freezes. And there's always the, you know, a partial, uh, a portion of the landscape, I guess, that will be adhered and frozen. <coughs> Aesthetically, these initial plots gave me some pause. Was ist das? What is this? Was willst du von mir? What do you want from me? The work seemed, to, seemed as concrete as they were abstract, I thought. Is this concre concrete abstraction, I would ask today? The indeterminacy of these objects was something that struck me. The underlying serial nature, irrespective of their formlessness, to me, the works read almost as absurd or surreal. Yet, their surrealism, I found, was immediately nullified by their concreteness, not to mention their superficial origin. At the same time, it was important to me to stay with this, at, at this time, it was important to me to stay with this technique. I did not want to invent another machine at the risk of fetishizing the spectacle of inve intervention, or invention, or even worse, the inventor. I thought it would be more challenging to stay with what was in front of me and figure out what was at stake, conceptually and aesthetically. And one thing I want to point out here uh, is the discrepancy in the work between the virtual state and the physical state. So all of these little uh, fingers that you can see in this image, for instance, are not part of the actual CAD drawing. Those literally like, happen as a byproduct of the process where the material kind of runs out of control. Um, in this series, I plopped the same drawing eight times under the following condition. For each production, the scale was changed ranging from 1 to 50 to 1 to 2,000. The cat drawing was scaled without loss of clarity or information. No abstraction was made. Together, as a group, the manufactured works next to each other seemed to fabricate something like a data-esque understanding of scale. And so this is the cup next to like two or three slides. Uh, a little bit difficult for me to talk about because um, you know, this was a time after Princeton where I was out of architecture school and I really wanted to work, kind of contextualize the work more in the context of painting. Um, I think I now look back at these works where I started using uh, kind of colored pigments within the resin um, and I don't think it's my strongest body of work. Um, so I think there's a, a lot of problems with them. No? No problems? A lot of, prob <laughs> a lot of problems with them. Um, but at the same time, it was important for me to make that body of work in order to arrive at somewhere else. So maybe that's why I'm showing it. One uh, little thing I want to point out, so this, if you look at the, the, the label here, uh, the materials is something I kind of frequently do or would do in an exhibition to kind of acknowledge uh, maybe the digital and the machine um, as part of the kind of like material conditions of this. Um, some pieces became calibration pieces. If you look at this one, uh, for me, it's interesting to see like the difference between a vertical line and a horizontal line. Vertical lines kind of just happen to be dots that connect. Horizontal lines become perfect. It simply has to do with how the machine is built. On one axis, the bat moves. On the other hand, the print head moves. And then the kind of greenish lines is a diagonal line where the two systems collide. Other works manufactured total abstractions where, com where the complexity didn't allow the machine language to read as clearly. This is the same drawing produced twice. And here I was interested in controlling the indexical marks of the shifts when the material takes over. So if you look at the cat drawing in this, I don't know if you can see that, but there's essentially there's no horizontal lines for the deposition. Um, 
but how these, what essentially makes this the grid and kind of like forms the structural integrity of this piece is these little valleys that you can see here. So like whenever you have two uh, small mountains that come together, they form a valley. When the saturation point is reached, the resin just kind of like sinks along. So it was a way for me to kind of like, in certain ways, undermine uh, some some of what the, 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 the other plops maybe were successfully doing. <coughs> After a, long, after a year long residency at the Academy Schloss Solitude in Stuttgart, I published Serial Nature, a book that critically examines my practice and work. The, work includes, the book includes five essay contributions that aim to unpack my work. I view the workings and conceptual, I view the workings and the philosophy of the machine in alignment with contemporary movements such as post digital. Conceptually, I identify with artists like Jody and Oliver Larrick, whose work engages in the digital media discourse. <coughs> However, something that stands out in the appearance of the works that the plopper creates. We notice that the plops look like their art. They have a strong aesthetic focus or presence. Their appearance as Kunst Kunst or art art, I would say could easily be dis dismissed as the plop's greatest weakness. weakness. Martin Beck, a Berlin-based philosopher, addresses this in his contribution titled Diagram Gesture Riddle Bone, the plopper as a philosophical machine in my recently published book. So I quote Martin on this one. But the plops not only grinds against, grind against our human excitement about our te grand technical ability to construct and fabricate, but also against our belief in our faculty for deep and intense sentiment. From their appearance, the plops seemingly try to look like their art, maybe like paintings or objects of abstract expressionism. These had been part of the great antithesis of the wonderful story of technique, construction, and mathematics, and control. The story of deep human power, of sentiment, and its artistic forms of expression and poesis. If we want to deceive ourselves in that direction, we could see the plops as almost human-like, soulful-inspired beings whose handless bodies try to form gestures to tell us everything about the profundities of human life and sentiment. Yet, this desire is nullified. This desire for ident identification is nullified by their spiritless and utterly superficial origin. Their kinship to the landmarks of human expression is itself only a very superficial one. They are the contingent product of a stupid machine, of stupid numbers, the, the spiritless machine, and the physical contingencies of their surroundings. At RISD, where I teach in the foundations department, I like to integrate technology in my courses in unorthodox ways, so that students immediately question and challenge the meaning of a use of a particular software or technology. For instance, when I introduce students to Rhino, a 3D modeling software, I usually give a very brief 15 minutes introduction to the user interface and the program's functionality. I then bring in a live model and continue with 3D modeling from observation. I give instructions that sit somewhere between a software tutorial and a classical live drawing session. Create a new layer and use the polyline tool only to draw a contour of the figure or draw a random shape. Use the copy tool to work out the shading by duplicating this curve. This playful and in certain ways impossible task that the students are confronted with instantaneously challenges the underlying mathematical bones of the software and its working environment. It also confronts the difference of virtuality and the nature of diagrammatic space in the CAT environment opposed to the actuality of space, of physical space in real life, an inquiry that is central to, my studio, to the studio, but also my practice. There is an element of data in this approach to technology in this assignment that is also present in my work. Eventually, I became a bit skeptical that the plopper seemed to be producing a kind of medium-specific body of work, almost in modernist fashion. A plopper being a printmaker, was an attempt to challenge this. Instead of fabricating a low-relief sculpture, the machine here drags an etching needle over a copper plate, once tied with a lace, as you see here, and another time tied with a, the, the needle is attached with a wire. I then followed a, a traditional printmaking process where the plate is submerged in acid bath and then printed it on a press. And so on. The result of these two prints, in both cases, the same cat drawing, 
the new drawing of a human figure is fed into the machine. The left shows the print when the needle is attached with a lace, the right when it was attached by a wire. <coughs> In 2014, it's gotten to a point where I was frustrated with the fact that I would create the initial drawing for the machine. I was interested in questioning, notion, questioning notions of authorship with the work. For me to create the seat was operating in opposition to this, as I remained the, auth the, the sole author throughout. I, it also seemed old-fashioned, because the work would follow a lineage from idea over sketch or drawing, and making to object or plop. The CAD compositions for this piece reference test patterns and structural compositions from common 3D printing path. Architecturally, I'm interested in this as an extension of high rationalism and material honesty celebrated by modernism and the international style. In a painterly context, I would discuss this as a continuation of a discourse around anti-composition. And this work, you know, I want to say was for me a seminal work uh, on many levels. You know, it was the first one where I used different types of sand uh, together and kind of this combinatorial game of the same panel plopped with different types of sand. So. Uh, you know, that was indeed due to the kind of making the work with the color plops and coming out of that and overcoming that to a certain extent. Um, so I think like things that didn't work so much with the, when it was the work that I made with the pigment, I think started to work here, but also then challenging this kind of like initial um, seat drawing a little bit more was a, was a big step for me. This work particularly resonate, resonates with me. For me, this work particularly resonates with the idea of the Anthropocene. These semi-unauthored artifacts may read as facade elements on one scale, can also be read as urban structures on another. The part to whole relationship here oscillates between the five panels that resemble the work and between the individual grains of sand. If there is a tension in the seams between these panels and the granu granularity of the sand particles, then similarly, I hope that the piece uh, as a whole operates as such a seam between the viewer and our natural and built environment. another attempt to undermine the authority of the CAD drawing. Here, the CAD drawing, drawing is exposed to virtual gravity in a computer simulation prior to fabrication. And the kind of like the blurry stuff that you see in that, that's just the, uh, actually the numbers of the path. So kind of like how the, how the machine would read that drawing, essentially. Um, I was inspired by the process. If before the work stayed clean and computed and perfect in its diagrammatic state, namely the digital drawing, and things that aren't messy only in the physical realm, then here I attempted to break these distinctions and, hierarchy and hierarchies. Almost in a kind of four-loop fashion, I try to replicate what is happening in the physical state of the work in the digital condition using the same logic for its distortion, gravity, and material behavior. And so this is an example of one work uh, where the cat was, that was fabricated without the gravity, so just the cat drawing, and then this is essentially the same exact cat drawing, but exposed to gravity. So you can see how you know it's hanging through. And then, of course, in this case, uh, it's installed on the wall, and the virtual gravity happens to align um, with the with the actual gravity in real life. So, yeah. Uh, similarly, in this seri this series, actually, uh, the drawings for this were generated by a little script. Uh, that would make essentially like an orthographic drawing randomly in one uh, certain area. And then I'd kind of exposed that same drawing to four times to gravity um, and, and plopped all, all four of them in an effort maybe to produce, I don't know, I, I'm not sure, I haven't really found that exact word and it goes a little bit to what Curtis was saying earlier. Um, I'm not sure if it's versions, but maybe there's something like about them as deficient bodies. Um, that kind of like all try to allude to something else. Now in this case, it's clearly no longer just the kind of like initial cat drawing, but maybe something else. In 2016, I wanted to dissociate myself at least temporarily from my studio and the tools and machines I was working with. Unofficially or informally, I call this body of work Kellerkunst, basement art. I locked myself up in my mom's basement in Cologne. Initially, I thought it would be fun to work with the same materials that I had already been working with, with the plopper to produce a kind of conversation. I made a series of small-scale sculptures like this one. Um, in this case, this is called individual. Um, and I found myself sculpting by hand, struggling with the materials as the resin hardened 
I tried to take control over the form, the viscosity changed too rapidly to model, the mixture would tear, dust and sand would get in the between the parts and I was that I was trying to adhere, it was terrible. This one is called Boots. This one is called Möbius Wurst. In the second step, I then 3D scanned the small sculptures. This one is Möbius Wurst 2, digitally processed here as a print from the 3D scan. And finally, this pace piece, which is called Sleeping Algorithms. In a last step, I used the digital counterparts of these original sculptures to get the 3D printing path that, that, a, that a common 3D printer would use to replicate the form. Common, 3D, common PLA printers print out rafts as a foundation that separates the object being printed from the bed in the machine. Um, this is the geometry of the raft for sleeping algorithms. I like that, I like that, the, that these objects are kind of, kind of byproduct, purely structural in their compositions, but also that they resemble only a shadow of the actual object that is being printed. I also find potency in the name raft. This is raft for sleeping algorithms. To make this, I projected the pathways and layers of the rafts onto, th onto the ground. I used them as instructions or plans to mimic what the plopper would do, only this time I did it by hand. Initially, I completely failed in doing so. So I tried to practice. Lessons in 3D printing, one through four, rafts, support, infill, and other, shown here are excerpts from 3D printing compositions they don't amount to an object or form, they are mere fragments. I use them as lessons and score in order to get into the rhythm. 10, 11, or 13 times, repeatedly, I would try to hand plop them. And so this is just showing the process when I'm preparing the bed, or actually, this is actually mixing the sand. There were two different types of sand, so I was mixing them. Um, and then setting up the bed slowly. And then kind of leveling the bed. Really detail oriented. And then this is where the fun starts, so you see the projected drawing of the 3D printing path and me trying to plop it. This was later after I practiced all of the, the, the lessons in 3D printing. And just fast forward, when the layer is done, comes another layer of sand. and another layer of resin. And I want to say that the size for these, I kind of like had to break them up. So this is actually uh, a three-part piece that I broke up because of the kind of like physical, I guess, limitations of my body. And then ultimately like the last layer, but you get the idea. Um, the exhibition in Berlin ultimately included all four aspects of the work. The original sculptures, the prints of the models, um, the raft drawings, and um, the raft sculptures, which I laid out directly on the ground, like this one, raft for the one lurches and wobbles. And I want to say also with this last, uh, these last kind of like flat panels, um, for me, that was a little bit of a new territory to try out something kind of like a little bit more in space before I would say like se being self-critical. A lot of the plops kind of too often happen to be on the wall. Um, and another aspect of that was the kind of like purposeful, like the flatness. I was really trying to like dim down the maybe like some of the formal excitement. Um, here's an installation shot of a recent piece titled Purling Grid. The formation of the sand landscapes in this work is determined by a purling algorithm a noise algorithm that is commonly used to simulate natural phenomena in computer graphics. In this piece, I was interested 
in taking this digital procedure used to emulate nature and returning it to the physical realm. Perlin noise is a procedural textual primitive, a type of gradient noise used to increase the appearance of realism in computer graphics. The function has a pseudo-random appearance, yet all of its visual details are the same size. Synthetic textures using Perlin noise are used in CGI to make computer-generated visual elements appear more like natural by imitating the controlled random appearance of textures in nature. Objects of, ex of application include surfaces, fire, smoke, clouds, but also terrain and vegetation. By now, these images have become ubiqu ubiquitous. In certain ways, they are the very grain of, comp of computation's idea of nature. And so here you see, uh, in a way, like the Perlin noise algorithm returned back to the physical realm in its material condition. Um, another aspect uh, also with this work is that it became freestanding. So a big step for me was to kind of use this metal framing um, and kind of like plop it and then put the metal frame down and then keep plopping um, so that the structure would essentially grow around that steel frame. Another interesting phenomenon is the negative landscape or image that is produced when the plop is removed from the bed of sand. I'm very much interested in the split that takes place at this very moment. This is an image. Um, this image shows the leftover trace of, of what's left after the plop is taken out. It becomes a shadow of the work. The plop then resurrects, becomes a kind of Fremdkörper, a deficient body. This interplay of present and absence between the cat drawing and the fabricated work and these two somewhat complementary but deficient landforms to me destabilize the objecthood of the works as such. Another aspect of this is, is the fragility of these works. Whenever I handle them, I have some traces of sand on my hands. The ephemerality is something that I actually would like to explore more. This is the most recent version of the plopper in my studio. I built this specifically to make some monumental plops, some of which you have seen earlier. Um, this is one of them, seven by 12 feet, one foot deep, about 600 pounds heavy. I wanted to push the work to the limits. Purposefully, I forced this piece to the point of breakage, testing its structural integrity. I love how these two pieces come back together. The reflective moments that you can see in here um, are imprints of the ground where the resin seeped through the sand. I like that effect, um, that they, I like the effect that they have and the difference that they produce. So on one hand, you get that the imprint of the ground, or the, which actually I would argue is more of a, an absence of that ground plane. And I very much like that kind of like that removal and kind of like back and forth that's happening there that almost renders the work more as a mm, kind of result of a subtractive process than an additive. Um, but then also just on the kind of like, uh, I guess like l when you observe the, the work, I think where it's cast against the ground, you get this very harsh surface uh, immediately you read form or object. Uh, in the other parts, you don't. Your eyes come kind of continuous, and it's maybe hard to see in these, but your eye continues to like move around. You never rest. And so there's something about that um, kind of like refusal, I think, to kind of like form a boundary or a surface that I think I really like that tension in this, in this work particularly. All right, second part, bear with me. This is not going to be as long. Algorithms and expectations. Science experienced a revolution in the 70s when bottom-up thinking challenged the basic methodologies, away from hypotheses that rest in approval or disapproval to the effects of emergence. Cellular automata are an example of this. They have been studied immensely by Wolfram. The simplest type of a cellular automata is a binary nearest neighbor one-dimensional automata. I would like to walk through this briefly <coughs> and explain the underlying system. In a given row of cells, is this something that everybody knows already? Okay. Otherwise, I would have just skipped forward. In a given row of cells, cells can either be dead uh, or alive, on or off, one or two, black or white, so to say. Based on the neighboring three cells that we see highlighted here in white, the system then will determine whether or not the cell in the next generation, here highlighted in gray, whoops, will be alive. This is called gener generative logic. <coughs> this is an example of a rule set. We see that if all three cells are alive, so if you look at the kind of the table on the bottom, the current pattern, if it says 111, all three cells are alive, this cell would be dead. Only if 
the cell on the only if only the cell on the li on the left is alive in the fourth pattern so we see one zero zero um, then the cell would be then the cell would be alive etc cetera, etc cetera. so you can imagine this um, and when you now start and it's always the question how do you start with that first generation that th there always needs to be a precedence for this right so in this case if you start with just one cell that's alive in the center of this uh, long row of cells or here pixels and then kind of like map this out compute out how the next generation will be the image that you will get is this and so what's interesting about this uh, or what's this what's interesting kind of like about this is that it kind of shifts um, in a way to like an observation of these phenomena or a study of these phenomena so we see obviously there's like larger patterns that extend out of uh, this like three or four neighborhood uh, kind of like community uh, that's I think something interesting you see also the repetition that's taking place on the left etc cetera, etc cetera. so um, now when you change the outcome of these so again we have the same start combinations obviously oops they can't be different we change which um, composition or combination creates what the, I the image that you get is an entirely different one again you get these visual patterns in it uh, that could be studied this is I think always the point where like it's supposed to get a little spooky uh, because then you're like whoa this also exists in nature but I think it's kind it's more funny than spooky uh, and of course we could also imagine that this happens in a two-dimensional plane so and then an, uh, an, an example of a two-dimensional cellular automata um, for instance you have a two start with a two-dimensional grid of cells and then you would always look for every cell so here highlighted the kind of cell that we look at is a blue you look at the surrounding eight neighbors and then count how many of the neighboring cells are alive and this is Conway's game of life and so in this you would then have the generative logic uh, with three simple rules a cell that is alive itself that has exactly three neighbors doesn't matter where they are would be reborn and a cell that is dead and has exactly two or, th or two or three neighbors will be re will be newborn all other cells die and so you would apply this to every cell on the grid without outputting them immediately but just calculating whether or not they will be on or off in the next generation and then do that and this is called uh, Conway's game of life from 1970 so this is an example Again, let's say we have this start combination. This would be the following generation that this, uh, that this uh, composition, maybe that's not the right word, uh, creates. This is the next, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what you see when this runs, and usually, of course, this would run over a computer screen very, very fast. Um, byproducts of this are still life. In other words, static objects that reproduce themselves, oscillation objects, cell combinations that or patterns that jump between two or more stages. Um, this is another example of a more complex, uh, I guess, oscillation objects. These are space gliders that walk around uh, and across the grid. This is a more complex pattern that would always reproduce itself, actually producing kind of like infinity because this would just go on forever. Um, and so in my own work, I've explored themes of emergence and the relationship of encoded information and instruction intensely. History of one organism, 25 by 33, is what I would call an algorithmic painting. The act of painting here is entirely dumped down. Deprived of human agency in the execution of the work, I drop spoonfuls of paint onto a wooden board. I literally reenact the game of life following the instructions of the computer simulation of Conway's 1970 game of life. For every cell that's alive, I drop a spoon of house paint. When, generation, when a generation is complete, the paint dries. Afterwards, I complete the next generation. What takes seconds to compute takes me many months to execute. To paint via this process means to manage paint. The question is no longer what or how to paint, but maybe how to cope with paint. History of one organism is made from simple house paint and a plain wooden board. My choice of material alludes to the everyday, the common, the banal. The statum of a mundane, almost an elementary material language extends throughout my work. Can we think of an Atepovera a la digital? And I think that's actually something that Jeff maybe put in my head as a, as a thought to uh, reckon with this. 
In 2013, I completed another history of one organism. A collector was interested in, in the first painting. Instead of shipping the work over from Germany, I thought it would be, would be conceptually more interesting to execute um, the instructional PDF again. Oops. I will also admit that the paintings are rather heavy. Um, and so here you see just some photographs of that second version of the painting. Of course, in close observation, the pieces are by no means identical reproductions. They appear more like twins, uh, twins that grew up in different parts of the world. One raised in Germany, fed thick, um, thick German paint. The other one upraised in southern New England, nurtured by American thin paint. Um, it's just like entirely different process. And it's something that I maybe didn't expect, uh, but actually I really liked in the end after all, that it's just another kind of like Param parameter like law, the uh, type of the type of uh, uh, house paint. German is dis Dispositionsfarbe here. It's like acrylic paint. Another way of looking at the same system: instead of being exposed to the actual organism in motion, for this piece, only the computer experiences the organism through its computation. I am given a record of the system, of the system's accumulative life slash death permutations which I hammer and inscribe into a flat sheet of aluminum. This was a way for me to question the correlation of physical labor, the human body, and orders of execution under a certain material condition. This is now 2015, 2016. These four works are part of a series of similar algorithmic paintings. And I'm also showing them to kind of like sh show some images of the process, uh, I guess. Um, all four are reenactments of the game of life again. All four have the same initial start condition at the beginning. Their diagrams are identical. However, as you can see, they have different orientations and angles in space. For me, this was an effort to both acknowledge and ov simultaneously overcome gravity as a totalizing force and condition. It is something I took from the gravity simulations um, that I showed earlier with the plops. So this is just an image of uh, me and an assistant working with them, you see the kind of projection of the PDF, you know, sometimes when I'm just working with myself, I just look at it on my, on my computer. Um, and so we would literally take spoonfuls of paint and for every cell that's alive, activate that cell. Uh, yeah, so this image captures the, captures the gesture, a careful drop deprived of agency. And this is in a kind of, an, it's in I think like about 80% done at the time. And I really wanted to push, at this point, the work to its limits. Uh, I think at this point, every painting of these four had about twi over 22,000 uh, drops of paint. So it's literally like it's bathtubs of paint that I'm like dropping over the course of 18 months. Another aspect was the size. This is four by four feet. I, again, I liked it because of the kind of like defaultness of it. It's just like a plywood sheet cut in half. But also the fact that it's like, you know, uh, kind of like obviously goes back to the, the human body and how much I can do, how much I can reach, etc. The duration and the impact of on the everyday. This series took about 18 months to complete. And then the final works. The normalizing gesture of when I hang them vertically is important to me. The titles here um, indicate, you can see this on the bottom left, indicate the vector uh, of the surface normal of the grid or plane. In other words, the, the work's orientation or board's orientation in space during the making. And so there was this, it's really hard, I think, to see probably in these images, I flipped through them, but you know, this one was uh, much less tilted, so it almost has more of a chest coming out, seems much more optimistic, whereas this one, next one seems to really kind of like a certain sadness that comes with it, I guess. Um, and you can see the impact of gravity and the spatial orientation. Keep smiling. In terms of the titles, this one is an outlier. With a bit of black humor, I chose this title to allude to the, to the endurance of the work. It also was a silly way to entertain myself or maintain sanity. I chose this, part this particular pattern or cumulative composition, as in the PDF or start combination, at least in part because I noticed and liked the grotesque, clown-like smiley face in the negative space of the work. It, also it, also, it is also somewhat a friendly smile 
at the critic I referred to in my first slide. Did I consider this from all sides? And you can see on the sides how the, you know, forms these kind of like stalactiles, drops down, escapes maybe the canvas. Okay, to conclude, um, I wanted to show a few more images of yet another series of Game of Life paintings that I'm currently working on. This time, they are matte black, a decision that seemed somewhat counterintuitive. I would almost say not my own. That's, uh, I have heard, actually, also, that it, that's not really like what the work is about. <laughs> but um, I did this because it seemed like a digital move. I just thought it's kind of funny. It's like changing the fill color of a shape in Illustrator. Like that was one aspect of it. Or maybe um, I liked it precisely because it was a sideways steps, sideways steps, and not a step forward. You know, like maybe a more logical within the system or kind of like work would have been to like choose the size of those, uh, change the size of a spoon or something like that, or do a series where I use like five different brands. I don't know. You know. Um, but so I really like that idea of like, kind of like staying stagnant with this and just like doing this sideways step and now making this like black series. It was also, this is, uh, started this in 2016, still working on them. Um, the, the white ones seemed so optimistic. You know, there was an element where I also, yeah, I, yeah, it's just, um, hard to photograph, yeah. Yeah, but these, f I feel like these photograph better than the white ones. Oh, yeah, well, that's true. Well, that's like, this is, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're a little bit more scary. Um, imagining the black and the white paintings next to each other. Um, <laughs> it was indeed also um, it was indeed also a wink at the binary determinism that inspired me to make this work. So that was another kind of aspect of why to make them black, you know. Yeah, the it's wooden board. Yeah, still the same wooden board. Thank you. Yes. So I haven't thought about the, the plopper or that project so much as like a simulation of 3D printing, even though that could be like an interesting one. So like one aspect of me reading that, the question is uh, to see whether or not in the end I'm just 3D printing. I don't know. Um, I don't know, I'm not sure. I, don't, I, don't th I, don't, I haven't had that issue so, uh, so much with the work for me that I felt like, am I just doing the same? It's st I still feel comfortably that this is a critique of 3D printing. So that's like one aspect. Uh, uh, maybe another aspect of simulation, and this is probably not what you're getting at, is, is but you know, I was saying earlier that the plops, they have such a strong formal presence, or like it's weird to me that even though I feel so close to artists like Jody that like are hackers and that work in a very different uh, kind of like output or medium or something like that, um, that in the end, like the plops, they look like art. And so there's th maybe that's an aspect of simulation. And um, you know, I mean, this shift is like six years, so a um, long time, I would say. I initially, you know, a part of the critique was to like actually like be interested in like 
uh, these machine produced forms that actually have like a phenomenological um, presence or like it's just like a material presence, not like a 3D print is such a stupid object, it's such a, like a material. And I mean, I love the potential perversity conceptually of that, but at the same time, they're just, you know what I mean? Like this is like shitty PLA plastic, just like maybe works in a kind of like representational scale when it's a model or when I mean it's a prototype or you see to do something. But overall, it's a pretty dumb technology and it produces pretty dumb aesthetics, I think. Uh, or pretty uh, dull, maybe, aesthetics. So at the same time, looking at this, uh, this art art thing that I was mentioning, you know, so like sometimes I feel self-conscious about this and I'm like, if somebody walks into this exhibition, do they just think this, this is just like a complete like modernist body of work? In certain ways, like building up this like whole body of work, trying to really go deep, is, I would say it's like it's a little old fashioned. And so I'm self-critical of that, you know, and, but at the same time then, you know, I kind of go back around and this is where the element of simulation comes in. I really like this idea of kind of like an implosion. So rather than like, uh, kind of like, just completely like doing something completely different, like overcoming modernism and just not doing like paintings anymore. I think it, I was I'm more interested in the kind of like subtle perversities. So I don't know if that goes to simulation, but and now I didn't talk about the simulation of the cat drawing, but. Uh, I agree, I think it's really brilliant. It's super interesting. I, I thought I could turn this into a question and probably come out more self-reflection. But uh, I think the, the simulation on it is one way to explore it, I think it's an interesting way. Another way, and what I kept thinking about as you were giving the talk, was the legacy of the index. So not a simulation so much, but you know, how you move information from one medium to another. And sort of thinking about indexicality and Jeff sitting there and I'm reminded of this idea of hyper-indexicality, where there are so many streams of information flowing into the object that it kind of explodes with these emergent effects that work. And I was thinking maybe that's what we're doing. But then I realized that it was, like, it seemed, that didn't seem quite right. And something that we were doing that a lot of like, like people like Jesse and Hanko and other architects were interested in this in, say, the 90s, out of this thing, actually. Uh, I realize that what we've added to that is that you're hijacking the indexable processes, right? So you're on purpose rearranging the actors. So in one version, you're the plotter instead of the plotter. Uh, in one version, you, know, you, you kind of screw up the expected time ratio. You know, the temporalities, the, 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 the perversions that you're talking about are ways of undermining the expectations of the next process. So maybe there's a critique in that. But for me, what's much more interesting about that is that there's, <coughs> it's a new kind of generative process that is the kind of index and I was always in some way looking backwards. I was always looking back at the source material and the And here, the source material is kind of too, but also matter. And also, um, kind of technically fraught to speak the same language. And so you can see how this isn't going to be a question. But, <laughs> I'm really it's really yes. uh, but I wonder if you thought about that. I mean, uh, are you specifically, there seems to be a theoretical agenda that has to do with hacking the hijacking the expectations that sounds like a uh, It sounds exciting, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I wouldn't want to say that that's, the, that that's my project. Uh, but definitely, you know, yes, a lot of those things, uh, I would say, are true and are part of that. You know, it's this removal of the source. It's, you know, w w moments when, and I didn't show this tonight, but like, when I take a 3D scan uh, of one of the plops and kind of like return it into the digital um, kind of condition and it becomes this like index landscape that's like full of marks on top of these marks and it's exactly it's exactly that. For me, you know, there's an aspect of where um, I guess it's a removal of the source, it's a removal of the objecthood in this case, you know, to not just always end on the plop but actually kind of like 
produce a certain hacking of it or something kind of like undermining of that or something like that? I don't know if that makes sense. But so it seems that there are really specific substitutions. <laughs> if you pick one point in the relationship between material mechanism author and make them all trade places or and so it's, it's a vocabulary that it seems like there's a vocabulary that exists to describe it, but it actually doesn't work when you try. Mm -hmm. And that seems to me to be a, a, a pretty good trick. <laughs> good trick. Huh. Okay.